Getting started in just a minute or two. So take your time <clears throat> to find a useful, helpful sitting posture for yourself. And we're going to um, do a little chanting and reflection at the end of the meditation today. Um, we'll take this opportunity to do the reflection on the Buddhist refuges and precepts, which we normally do around the solstices and equinoxes four times a year. So we'll just settle into the city practice today. Appreciating being able to sit with each other in this way. And that sense that even something as simple as our sitting posture, it really is a way of joining in, connecting with really an innumerable number of human beings present and past who really found this form useful to sit down in an upright way that supports clarity, alertness. And then inviting the body, the heart and mind to relax, to settle, maybe take a couple of longer, deeper breaths in and out, but in a way that has some pleasure, even though it might be a very simple pleasure but to simply feel the lungs and the body filling and then emptying the lungs, nourishing the body with oxygen. And in a very simple way, as we're settling in, Let's use this activity of breathing and more generally this activity of sitting, the body sitting here. We're using these ordinary activities as a kind of working ground, a place to gather the energies of the mind and heart. So we're simply practicing remembering that we're breathing in and breathing out, or more generally remembering that the body is sitting here as we're breathing in, and the body is sitting here as we're breathing out. And by bringing our attention to these simple activities of sitting and breathing, it's relatively easy to let go of everything else. So in a relaxed way, we're choosing to be interested in the experience of breathing in and breathing out or choosing to be interested in the experience of sitting, the sensations in the body as we breathe in and out.
And we can be grateful to have this activity of breathing and this more general activity of sitting here as a place, a working ground, training ground to gently and thoroughly gather the energies of the heart and mind to really show up for these two simple experiences of breathing in and out and sitting. And we're choosing to let these be the most important, most important experience here in the moment, moment by moment. And most importantly then to notice the pleasure of this gathering, the, the pleasure of the unifying of the mind. It's this thread of pleasure, the pleasure of the mind unifying, coming together. The opposite would be a scattered or dissipated, distracted mind. It's this pleasure of the mind gathering and coming together that provides the necessary feedback mechanism so in a sense, we learn how to heal this wound of distractedness, this wound of the mind, the heart being scattered and reactive and pushed around by the joys and sorrows of life in ways that aren't helpful. It's not about becoming insensitive. It's about learning how to remain whole even during the push and pull of life. And to start out, we learn that wholeness by intentionally choosing to be attentive to something ordinary like breathing in, breathing out, or feeling the whole body sitting as we breathe in, feeling the sensations of the whole body sitting as we breathe out. And there's something healing and calming about this simple way of training, organizing the mind. This healing feels good. So as you're breathing in, noticing the calm in the body Notice the healing calm in the body as you breathe out. It's a simple reflection of the mind body coming together. No longer at war, the mind no longer in denial of the body.
And at some point, the healing, the healing space, the qualities of calm and that lightness of heart, joyful interest, and even a more resonant ease. So at some point, these wholesome qualities of the mind settling, the mind becoming more gathered, become apparent. So then the breath can fall into the background more. We'll still notice that the breath is coming in, the breath is going out. Still notice that the body's sitting. But we can be aware of that wholeness, that lightness, that ease as we're breathing in, as we're breathing out. We're beginning to sense the trustworthy space of the heart and mind, the mind that's settled and clear and light and not so pushed around by thoughts or memories or whatever else comes and goes, sounds, sensations. It's just the next thing being known or being felt, being experienced. And in a sense, the awareness is grounded in the healing space of calm, of joy, of ease, and this wisdom of dispassion, that everything has permission to come and go. It doesn't have to be a problem. Even so-called intense thoughts or intense memories, they also have permission to come and go when they do. So let's continue to practice like this in silence.
of course, there will be those whirlpools of the thinking mind, the worrying mind, imagining mind, that's okay. Notice that these dramas, even the intense ones, they arise, they feel like the way they feel, and then eventually they cease, especially if we're not confused, imagining that the drama is more than what it is. It's something that is being felt, something that's being seen and experienced, something here and now being known. That's all. So we allow our experiences to be what they are. We're not at war with distraction, not trying to get rid of anything. We just understand that these, this experience, it arose, it feels like this, it looks like this. It's just this experience being known. And we're patient letting it cease on its own as it will. And then notice again that sense of space, the space of the here and now, space of the knowing mind. And although this is a refined experience, this can be the object of meditation, the sense of space, the sense of knowing space, silent space, space empty of drama. And then when the next drama does arise, then we see it for what it is. This impersonal drama arising because of causes and conditions. Even if the mind is somewhat entangled, identified with the drama, we notice that. Oh yeah, it feels like this, to be caught up. And like everything else, this will arise, has arisen, will last for a while, and then will pass away. It may sound funny to say it this way, but all of us, we're just sitting here practicing or learning how to be alive. 
So we're using the relative simplicity of the formal sitting time to learn the skillful way of showing up, skillful way to be relating to what's here and now, how not to plant seeds of stress, but instead how we can plant seeds of release, seeds of a generous, loving, healing attitude. So it would be appropriate even to ask, what's the skillful way now for the heart to be showing up, to be relating to what's happening? What's the healing way, the skillful way? The wise way to be relating now. Relating to the breath, relating to the sitting body, and of course, relating to all the activity of the mind the thinking mind. So for the last few minutes, two or three minutes, maybe experiment with the sense of being the vast broad and deep ocean, the great space of the present moment in a way that allows the heart to be unafraid of whatever comes and goes, whatever's moving as sensation or thought or emotion. the boundless ocean of love, the boundless ocean of wisdom, Something that's here and now that doesn't have any problems with what's coming and going, what's moving. a little time and gently begin to adjust the body as you need to.
Here we go. So I just put a link in the chat. Don't feel like you have to open up that document because I'll walk us all through. Once a quarter, we've, as a community, done the refuges and precepts. And it's one of these traditional practices that have been done in all the different Buddhist traditions and all the different places the teachings of the Buddha have gone. And I think it, as a ceremony or as a recitation, it can be misunderstood. It's really up to each of us to make it something meaningful and practical and useful in terms of our own you know, how we understand our own practice. So I'll just give you an example how I do this reflection. And then you can open this document at another time, perhaps, um, and just make it your own at any frequency, whether you do it every day or once a month or whatever makes sense, or do it with our community on Sunday morning, usually around the solstices and equinoxes. And we usually begin by acknowledging our teacher. So we see this person who lived about 2,500 years ago that we refer to as the Buddha, which is actually a title or an adjective, someone who is awake, an awakened one. And uh, the, what, just a, sort of an aside, because some of you may not know, the Buddha, what makes the Buddha different from another awakened one, like you get that title of a Buddha when you wake up, but you wake up without the teachings of somebody else who's woken up, right? So the, you know, the sort of mythology of Buddhism, there have been many Buddhas, some Buddhas, some awakened ones who didn't have teachings to help them, weren't able to teach, they were awake, they had deep insight, but they didn't have kind of the personality to teach. They're called Pacheta Buddhas. And there are other Buddhas that could teach, but they happened, they lived so long ago that at some point, nobody remembered the teachings of that Buddha, right? And then another person would arise and have the deep insight and have the capacity to teach, to share it in a way that makes it easier for other people to do the practice. And so we're living currently with the teachings of this person, another human being like us, with a mind like us who had deep insight and was able to articulate in ways that were helpful to others, how he came to understand his own heart and mind and to release the mind from ignorance, basically from misunderstanding one's experience, taking it personally. It isn't enough to be told, Hey, we shouldn't be so attached. We've all been, told that many times, but it doesn't necessarily change our life and the amount of suffering we experience. So we generally begin the refuge and precept ceremony by acknowledging our teacher and the, the line that we repeat three times is namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. And it's basically a way of saying I acknowledge that I am the beneficiary of these really useful practical teachings. And I'm grateful that there was this person who was able to wake up, have deep insight and articulate that awakening process in ways that help sort of map out my own personal inner journey of awakening, right? Even, even though the Buddha lived obviously a long time ago, different culture, somehow through translation, through being passed down through so many generations, still the teachings are very powerful and uh, practical. So that that's, uh, says something about the um, articulation that the Buddha was able to express about his inner process. That's not so easy. If you've ever been in a practice meeting with a teacher, like on a Buddhist retreat, and the teacher says, so what are you learning or what's happening in your mind? You realize it's not so easy to express like what we're learning, what we're seeing that we haven't seen before, how that's changing, how we are as a human being. And, but fortunately, being able to articulate our experience isn't 
the same as waking up. We can wake up and have very little capacity to articulate it to our friends. That's a nice thing, right? So we start with that. We acknowledge, appreciate the Buddha, the awakened one. What other humans have done like the Buddha, we can also do. So that's part of that acknowledgement that this is a path not by somebody who's uh, had some capacity that we don't also share that potential. But no, we share that same potential. And then what is traditional is just to take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha three times. So when I'm doing this at home, like in the morning before my morning sit, I might do the first one in the Pali language. I might chant, you know, Buddhang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami. Then I might say it in English for the second time. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. And then the third time, because it's traditional to do it three times, I might actually explain to myself what I mean. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in being awake and being open and seeing clearly. That's what I, how I understand taking refuge in the Buddha. And then I take refuge in Dhamma. I take refuge in the way it is, not the way I want it to be. I take refuge in being intimate with conditions, with reality, as it's actually presenting itself now, here and now, to this sensitive heart. So that's what I, how I define taking refuge in Dhamma. It's about being grounded in the here and now, not lost in hopefulness, not lost in fear, but just dealing with my life as it's presenting itself. And then I, when I translate or define what it means to take refuge in Sangha, I, I might reflect and I take refuge in those who show the way, like appreciating the wise teachers I've been able to connect with and how they've been able to some degree at least model the Buddha being intimate with Dhamma, you know, being awake to the way it is not being afraid to be real. And the kind of skillful actions, skillful words that can flow out of that intimacy, Buddha knowing Dhamma. So when Buddha is intimate with Dhamma, wakefulness being intimate with the way it is, then Sangha can arise for you, for me, for our teachers, for anybody. For a moment, right? We've had moments of being Sangha where because we were awake, open, clear, not muddled minded, but clear minded, open hearted with the way it is, with the way it actually is, then our actions were relatively skillful and wise and wholesome. And that's what we mean by Sangha. When we see these enlightened actions coming out of ourselves, coming out of another being, because they're in that moment at least living Buddha knowing Dhamma being awake to the way it is. So this is just a good thing. It's sort of a short summary of the whole path and it's meant to be a very alive thing. So even though we can do it as a formal ceremony recitation, it can get very stale and not useful. So it's actually useful instead to have this recitation that you might do alone before, you know, once a week before a set to kind of make it more of a contemplation or a reflection. What do I mean by Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha? What is, what, how is my heart actually valuing being awake, valuing being intimate with the conditions of my life, valuing a kind of showing up that really comes out of that intimacy? What have I learned about those three refuges? And then I'll review the precepts in my mind. And I'll often do them both in the Pali and the English. Panati pata where amani sika padang samadhi ami. I undertake the training to refrain from harming living beings. And then I might just think about that for 15 or 20 seconds. Like the places, where is the rub around non-harming in my life right now? I was, uh, some of you know, on retreat for um, two and a half, three weeks 
at Kamagran's retreat property and there was a fruit fly infestation. Maybe I mentioned that last week. And it was like a very interesting place to practice non-harming because they would like hover around your face. Somebody had donated some plants to the center, to the retreat property, and they must have used compost in the soil of these indoor plants. <laughs> and so <laughs> the whole building has fruit flies everywhere. And we're trying all sorts of techniques to minimize the, rep the fruit flies amazing capacity to reproduce without directly killing them. And it's just so, it's very interesting, like even how you swat them away, you know, is it an aggressive, like, I really want to, <laughs> I really want to harm you, or is it, you know, fly somewhere else, please. What's the attitude? Is it an attitude of harming or is it an attitude of non-harming? Can we take care of ourselves without falling into the habit to kill and harm what's bothering us? Same thing with our cat, which I, you know, is, you know, a being that I really care about. But when the cat irritates me, I notice like gets me up early in the morning before it's supposed to, it's not supposed to wake us up until 5 a.m. And even though the cat's five or six now, it still is not that good at reading the clock. But, <laughs> but it, it's amazing that it is getting closer to five o'clock most of the mornings. Um, but I notice, especially when my partner's not around and the cat is sort of reaching out with its paw to touch my face or to bite my toe or something like that to wake me up, that it's like for in a flash, you know, it's like that anger comes. I just, I'd be very happy to harm that cat. I mean, I'd, I don't like to say that. It's a little embarrassing, but there really is that raw anger that gets triggered. So that's why we undertake this training. It's like an exploration of all the, it illuminates all those places in our lives where the, those flashes of anger come, like people who have different political opinions than we do, right? And all the places where we unconsciously probably rationalize being able to hate, oh, it's okay to hate this person. It's okay to throw this person out of my heart, right? They don't deserve kindness. They don't deserve understanding. They, disturb, they deserve my hatred, my whatever. So we undertake the training to refrain from harming living beings. Adina dana where amani sikha padang samari ami. I undertake the training to refrain from taking what hasn't been given to me. And that's just another ongoing training we can have with the second precept. Because it really, it's really this um, training in dana that you hear us talk about sometimes at Common Ground. Because as most of you know, we don't charge for any of the programs. We haven't since we began in 1993, the center. We haven't charged for anything, including our residential retreats, because we're inviting everybody to be part of the circle of giving and receiving, where we really learn how to receive freely when something's been given to us, and we learn how to give freely. And even when we're in a more formal give take situation, like we're shopping and we're going to pay for whatever we're buying, the, the feeling in our heart can be of freely giving the money to the store. Same thing at our places of business or where we work. You know, we may put in our hours, may, we may receive a check at the end of the month, but the understanding, the way we relate to that can be this sort of free receiving, free giving, not this kind of strategic business, how much can I get? How much do I have to pay? Where it's sort of a, a formalized war between powers, you know, like I studied economics when I was in college and it's sort of like this tension between supply and demand, those who have something to sell those who want something, right? And it's sort of like who has power until the power is matched, like how much I want it is matched by how much you're willing to give it to me for, and then we have a price. But that doesn't have to be that way. We can really find this more beautiful and healing reciprocal way of being in the world. 
but it's really up to us. And this is what the second precept is all about. And in particular, in the places where we're receiving, like the next breath, the next glass of water, the next interaction with another human being, next time we eat, the next time we have something to use, clothes to wear, a bell to ring or whatever it might be, a clock to look at. Can we have that energy Oh, this clock and seeing the time it's freely offered, right? And so I can really receive it in that spirit, this breath, this interaction with this person. And just feeling the, like no underlying unfinished business because so much in economics arises because of exploitation different beings are being oppressed or being taken advantage of. And we conveniently are not aware of all the reverberations of, you know, what's behind the scenes. So when we undertake the training to refrain from taking what hasn't been given to us, don't expect to get there. <laughs> it's not about getting there where, okay, finally it's clean. You know, I haven't taken anything that wasn't freely given. It really illuminates how messy these circles of giving and receiving are. Even in our intimate relationships with our partners and with our pets, it's complicated, isn't it? Is your dog really freely giving his love, right? Or is it like, if you feed me, you know? And it's just, it just makes us, it really illuminates the quality of our way of relating to each other and especially in these sort of business places and how can they have a different tone? Like a, instead of being a little war between two powers, how can it be something that has more the flavor of love and generosity? And you know, it's so easy to think, oh, that's as, as economists often will tell us, you know, that's, that's not how the world works. You know, it's really, it is, we, we rely on people's greed to balance out everything. And that's the economy sort of built on that principle of people maximizing their happiness. And then the third precept is about sexuality. And so when we're lay people, we're not on retreat, we're engaged in sexual activities, then it's chanted this way, Kame Su Michachara, where Amnani Sika Padang Samadhi Ami. I undertake the training to refrain from sexual misconduct. And then this is just the Buddha saying, there's nothing wrong with sex, sexual relationships, but it's a place where this circle of giving and receiving freely, right? Because the instincts are so strong and our cultural conditioning is so confused, right? Where we can cause a lot of harm. So the Buddha specifically highlights this area, just like he does with the fifth precept around alcohol and drugs and intoxication. It's not that alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants in and of themselves are inherently bad. It's just a place because of the nature of intoxicants, the mind gets careless. Well, in terms of sexuality, because of the strength of our conditioning, you know, and the instincts around sexuality, you know, we lose that wise space and uh, desire and the wanting to fulfill the desire can kind of blind us to seeing the bigger picture. There's another living being here. So that's just a very interesting place to highlight. Even, you know, I, I noticed that even as an older person now in my 60s, it's like, oh yeah, that energy is still there. <laughs> it expresses itself differently, but it's still there. And just to be really honest about it, it's part of the, you know, what makes human existence interesting and also what makes human existence really challenging is that there's just so much stuff around sexuality. And we're, you know, we live in a culture, we've been culturally conditioned to sort of 
be confused and unaware of a lot of our conditioning around sexuality. And so it comes out in all kinds of different ways. And to, you know, the, <laughs> the danger sign is when we think we've kind of worked ourselves through it and we have a grip or we sort of know who we are in that arena. And it, it doesn't mean we haven't learned a thing or two, but I think a kind of humility is what seems really useful because then we're still interested and we see it in others and we see it in ourselves. And we, that's, the, that's really the key, like to not cause harm in all these places, we have to be interested. We have to care. Otherwise we don't pay attention. We think we're already out of the woods. We've already done our work. You know, this isn't an issue for me. And then, that, then we can sort of bet that, you know, there's something we're not seeing. And then the fourth precept is Musa Wada, where Amani Sika Padang Samaria Me. I undertake the training to refrain from false speech, which usually is defined in these four ways using speech as a weapon, like slander, using harsh speech, lying, or speaking mistruths. And then the fourth is idle speech. So even speech that doesn't really, isn't really needed is considered uh, sort of not helpful, not a breaking of this precept. So this is a training. And again, we're never going to get it right. Our speech will never be perfect, but we can get interested like, oh, was there a kind of harshness to the way I spoke that wasn't really helpful here? Or we can look. Was I using truth, but using it as a kind of weapon to cause harm, like throwing truth at someone? Or was I intentionally lying or leaving out some of the truth to protect myself or to shade something? Or am I just blabbing about the weather or something, not because I'm being friendly, but because I'm afraid of just being in the stillness, being in the quiet? So filling up space with words in a way that isn't really doing justice to um, kind of the other person. I'm sort of stealing their time by my going on and on in a way that's not respectful. So there's no end to the training for these five precepts. And the last one I mentioned already, Sura Maria Maja Pamaratana, where Amani Sika Padang Samari Ami. I undertake the training to refrain from the use of or the misuse of intoxicants, drugs, and alcohol, but also even media, different kind of um, you know movies, magazines, whatever that are like an intoxicant, and the mind gets colored, gets um, disoriented just like we would by taking drugs or alcohol too much, we can get disoriented by certain medias that we overconsume or we indulge in in a way that distorts the mind, colors the mind, so the mind isn't clear. And again, that the point of this fifth training is the deep valuing of, of clarity. Like we don't want to cause harm for ourselves or for others and the best way to not cause each other harm is to stay clear, to be sensitive, to just have a sense of what's moving, what's happening. And so when we choose to intoxicate ourselves, well, then obviously we increase the odds that we're going to cause harm. And, you know, when we cause harm, so the, the trainings, these five trainings that we come back to, it's what we really want is the happiness of being in the world, being in relationship, but knowing like deep in our heart, knowing that I'm not in any way intentionally causing harm. I may still like, but this is this humility. I still may be causing harm unintentionally through the lack of awareness, lack of sensitivity, but I'm not causing harm in how I'm relating in terms of the give and take of life. That's the second precept in terms of sexuality, in terms of my speech, 
in terms of indulging in intoxicants. And then we have that sort of background of my heart, my way of being in the world, my way of being in relationship is trustworthy. And it's like giving the gift of non-fear. You don't have to be afraid of me. And again, it's not that we're perfect, but that's the direction we want to move in. And it, it's in the Buddhist uh, understanding, in the teachings of the Buddhist understanding, this is what self-esteem feels like where we reflect on the day we lived or the interaction we were just part of. And there's that clean feeling afterward, like I didn't intentionally use my words to cause harm. I didn't intentionally take something that wasn't given to me. I didn't intentionally flirt or use sexual energies in ways that were inappropriate or, you know, confusing to that other person or, or whatever. And then it feels good, right? Being clean in that way, it's the Buddha calls this the bliss of blamelessness or the, the happiness of non-remorse. We all know what it feels like when we were in a interaction and then the flavor afterward is, oh, yuck, I am so, you know, that didn't feel good. And, and we feel a lot of remorse, like I wish that didn't, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I didn't do that. I wish I hadn't acted in that way. And that can haunt us for a long time. Even those situations where we can make amends and ask for forgiveness, still, I'm not a parent, but I'm, I'm guessing many of you are parents. And I can imagine it's not easy being a parent. And probably you made some mistakes. And probably that doesn't feel good. I noticed this a lot, uh, certainly in the early years, even more so, but after Dharma talks, giving a talk like this, you know, and then you kind of, it's sort of an intense situation, especially when people are there in the room with you and then it's over. And then it's like everything that wasn't quite right is sort of reverberates in the heart. Like, oh, I said that. Oh, I got out of balance in that way. I got a little too excited or I, you know, answered that question in this way. And that didn't really, wasn't really being sensitive to that person and where they were coming from. And it's like, oh yeah, just like I have that same experience in my interactions with my partner, or my spouse, when a lot of, you know, when one of our teachers at common ground and the co-founder of the center and just, uh, you know, like where the mind is a little off, a little aggressive, a little defensive, a little this, a little that. But we want to be grateful. This is the whole point of these five mindfulness trainings, the training to not harm, undertaking the training to not take something that hasn't been freely offered, undertaking the training to refrain from sexual misconduct, undertaking the training to refrain from unuseful speech, unhelpful speech, harmful speech, undertaking the training to refrain from intoxicants or using intoxicants in ways that make us careless. Because, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to judge and people who might have a glass of wine or something like that, because there are probably ways to use what we call intoxicants in ways that don't affect our exposure, our carelessness, but there are definitely ways to misuse them. That, that's for sure. And there are a lot of people who have difficulty with that edge. I'm someone who, you know, my, I don't know when it was, I guess pretty early in my twenties, I just stopped drinking and using drugs, even though in my early twenties and teens, I definitely indulge. But I just realized like with my personality, it's a lot easier just to refrain from using them because I like getting high and I like that feeling of being intoxicated. And it's not so easy to stop after one beer or one joint or one this or one that. So I just stopped. And that for me made a lot of sense, but you know, everyone's got to find their way. But the key to this training uh, from Buddhism is really to appreciate wanting to be full of care, not wanting to be careless, 
because it matters. When we make a mistake, like I was saying a few minutes ago, it will haunt us for a long time. That moment of carelessness. Maybe some of you are part of the people we have, I don't know, dozens, I think, of people in the wider Buddhist community here in the Twin Cities that regularly go into all the you know, juvenile halls and the state penitentiaries and the different places where people are incarcerated, <clears throat> excuse me, and they teach Buddhism or mindfulness practices. And one of the things I've done a little bit of that teaching myself over the years, but uh, one of the things that some of these teachers report over and over again in their conversations with the people who are incarcerated is like that simple moment of being careless leading to some action that has profound ramifications for that person's life. And I know I can see them in my life. I bet you can see them in your lives where we've dodged some of those bullets, where we were actually intoxicated or being careless for whatever reason, texting in a car or whatever it might've been, and something really bad could have happened and it was just a matter of odds in a way that we escaped the negative consequences of not being so full of care. So it isn't about getting tight. It's just about caring about our life and caring about other people's lives and knowing how easy it is to cause harm and knowing how easy it is to set in motion really painful causes and conditions for ourselves and for others. Even something as simple as removing the spiders from your, you know, the corner of your ceiling. Because there's ways to do that that can be full of care. And there are ways to do that that is not full of care. Not valuing the life of another living being. Just like me with the fruit flies. And the question is, does it matter? And you can answer that for yourself because you have this sensitive heart. So notice if it matters. It's not about the Buddha isn't saying it matters. He's saying undertake the training to refrain from harming and notice what happens. Undertake the training to refrain from taking things that aren't being freely offered and notice if it leads to happiness. Undertake the training to refrain from sexual misconduct and see if it really enlivens your life and, or does it make you a sour, repressed person? <laughs> you know, this is the point. It isn't about being tight or being self-righteous and being on that high horse who's better than everybody else. It's about whether it leads to freedom and ease and skillfulness in life, the bliss of non-remorse. So these are the, the three refuges and the five mindfulness trainings or the five precepts. And like I said, the link is there in the chat. You can copy it, get your own copy of it. But I really recommend for those of you who are feeling connected with the Buddhist teachings, it's been the way over the many centuries, the 2,600 years, like how do you know somebody is a student of the Buddha, it's not so much like other religious traditions where people who are um, following using these teachings, they believe in a God or not. It's really not really about that. It's really about finding value in a set of teachings that were articulated by a human being like us 2,600 years ago. If you find value in these, then we call ourselves people who are, we don't actually, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't even use the word Buddhism, right? That it's really like we're students of the Dharma and the word Dharma means we're students of the way it is, right? We're using our capacity to be clear and awake Buddha. That's what Buddha means. Buddha means awake. Bodhi, the root of that word means to be awake to Dhamma the way it is. Buddha wakes up to Dhamma. So that's really 
our religion in a sense. It isn't a faith in a higher power. It just puts that question aside in a way. You don't have to, you can have whatever, you know, your instincts are, whatever, fine. But on top of that, whatever that might be for you, are you interested in being awake to the way it is? Has, is that intriguing? Has that led to an underst understandings that have sort of been liberating in your life, useful in your life? Well, then you're a Buddhist or you're somebody interested in the way it is. And you, then you might find these teachings from this human being 2,600 years ago very useful. And that's really what it means to be a Buddhist. And then what this one ceremony, all the different traditions, Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrayana, even Pure Land, right? The different major Buddhist traditions, lineages, they all take refuge in Buddha, being awake, Dhamma, the way it is, and Sangha, this enlightened, loving, compassionate activity when we're coming, living from that place of intimacy, Buddha knowing Dhamma. And then these five trainings, it's like the Buddha's highlighting where to pay attention. Pay attention where you justify causing harm. Pay attention wherever you're taking something. Pay attention wherever sexual energy is involved. Pay attention to wherever you're using words and pay attention to wherever you're uh, playing with intoxicants. And that's the five mindfulness trainings. And it's kind of neat that these very practical, you know, this very practical functional recitation, being awake to the way it is so we can live from that place of intimacy while paying attention to harming, paying attention to taking stuff, paying attention to sexual energy and speech and intoxicants, that sort of is what we sort of use as a community. Oh yeah, this is one of our shared values or these are our shared values that uh, kind of makes us community. So this is something that we do once a quarter, but I personally do it quite frequently and I invite you also to kind of make it your own and to reach out with your questions. You know, if you don't remember, we have uh, uh, practice check-ins weekly. Uh, Shelley Graff does their check-in every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. And Stacy McClendon and I have one on Tuesday at 12 noon. And then Win Fricky and I do one on Saturday, one Saturday a month at 8 a.m. on Saturday usually the second or third Saturday of the month, you can check her calendar. And this is a good time to ask questions. But Shelly and I also have one-on-one -on -one sessions and you can find that. You can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one practice meeting with us on our website. You just look under programs and one of the listings under programs are practice meetings. And then that will lead you to a calendar where you can sign up for a one-to-one -one meeting. And of course, we're doing everything online these days. Um, but that way, if you have specific questions about these refuges and precepts, it's really good to talk to uh, somebody who's been doing the practice for a long time or a teacher when you have the opportunity so that you can really make them your own and bring them alive in your life. And this is an important, this is in a way, one third of the training is this uh, work with uh, ethical conduct. And the other Third is the wisdom, which is really the understanding of Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And the last third is this more specific training to settle the heart and mind, like to really value the clarity of the stability of present moment awareness, what we call samadhi. So really nice to be with everybody today. Uh, Nancy and Shannon take turns organizing the community into small groups. So. If you want to just stay around for a few minutes in the transition, then uh, Nancy today will put you in a small group and you can have a conversation for about 15 minutes with a few other people in the community. And it's just really a nice time to connect. But before we end, I just want to remind folks, we have our New Year's Eve 
celebration this year online, 7 to 9 p.m. on Thursday evening, the 31st. Please join us, Gabe Keller, uh, Flores, and Ellis, two wonderful performers will provide some music, and Stacy and Shelley and Wynn and I will organize some reflections and invite some reflections for you. And we'll have our own particular one-time only spontaneous Dharma poem right at uh, a few minutes before 9 p.m. on that Thursday night. So join us for that. Uh, it's really a nice gathering. And then we have our, our Winter Buddhist Studies beginning on the 11th of January. Another six-week intro class is beginning Tuesday night, the 12th. And finally, uh, Gabe mentioned to me that the snow blowing team led by Rob, very grateful for Rob for leading it these last few years, looking for a few more people who live in Minneapolis, St. Paul area to help us uh, snow plow. We have a wonderful snow blower and shovels. <laughs> so if you've got some time and live close enough to the center and wanna help out, just contact Gabe at the info at email. Um, and then uh, he'll get you on that email list and you take turns. So it's not too much of a burden. So nice to be with everybody today. Thank you so much. And hang on if you wanna connect with Nancy and be in one of the small groups. Take care everybody.